Welcome to the Julia and Gino podcast, where business meets family. We explore what the entrepreneurial life looks like from a family perspective. We are your hosts, Julia and Gino Barbaro. Hey everyone, this is Julia Barbaro, host of the Gino and Julia show. I am joined with my husband, my co-host and the co-founder of Jake and Gino, Gino Barbaro. For everyone out there, it is the Julia and Gino show, not the Gino and Julia show. Yes, Julia is first. Our guests today, Julia, are Philip and Pauline McKernan. Philip is the author of One Last Talk, Why Your Truth Matters and How to Deliver It. Pauline is known by people as the silent rock, aka Julia, who may appear to sit in the shadows, but nothing could be further from the truth. Together, they support people with a genuine desire to leave the world in a better place than they found it, to lead a better life personally and professionally. Welcome to the show, Philip and Pauline. Welcome. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. First question. Greatest gift lies next to our greatest pain. Right here. That's my greatest gift, my greatest pain. Philip, can you expand upon that a little? I'm sure Pauline probably thinks that about you as well. So, <laughs> Yeah, I'm definitely a pain. Um, <laughs> I suppose the best way to describe this is the context of, I suppose, my own journey. Uh, I see this as a more kind of a personal maybe exploration to us rather than speaking sophically around the world. Mm -hmm. I remember when I went to therapy for the first time in my life and it scared the shit out of me because I remember coming out of that room and I literally, I think I, I bent over and I kind of had my two hands in the, just above my knees and I was bent over as if I was about to vomit because I felt that way. And I was astounded by the amount of pain and sadness and anger that I had inside of me because I wouldn't have said I was angry and I wouldn't have said I was sad and I didn't necessarily associate with trauma. And the journey then began where up to that point, I thought I was broken. I thought there was something wrong with me. Why, why, why am I achieving? Why am I moving forward? Why am I happy? And I'll, and I'll fast forward the story. I, I, the job for me was then to begin to excavate and to examine and uncover the things that held me back, the pains, the things I wasn't proud of, the shame that I had. And long story short, I think beginning to examine those things and processing them is one thing. Feeling the spectrum of emotion around those things is the second. So beginning to forgive myself and the people around me for the things I've done and the things they've done to me. And the final piece, which took me a lot longer, and I, st I would respectfully say I'm still processing, is beginning to accept it. And then the final, final, final piece is seeing that actually the pain that I've gone through, for many, this is too big a stretch right now, not because they're not intelligent, they're just not ready to hear it, that the very pain that I went through is actually the gateway to the very gifts that I have. And now I bring my pain back to the world, and now I can help eradicate that pain or fast track that for people in the world so they don't have to suffer perhaps to the extent I did. So that's me explaining why your greatest gift lies right next to your deepest wound from a personal perspective. And Pauline, as you're, as you're seeing him go through this pain, how is it for a spouse to see that? How, how did you feel? I mean, how did you support him through all of these struggles? Well, I think it's really difficult to see someone that you love um, hurt. And so first of all, you want to protect them. And so you question maybe the journey that they're on. But then you begin to see sparks and a little light at the end of the tunnel. And so as difficult as it was and hard for me to see him suffer, um, being able to see him grow through the process was actually very inspiring and it actually made me want to lean in and do some work myself. So I think holding him and believing in him and that's how we got through it, you know, and supporting him. And, uh, you know, I trust him implicitly if he believes he needs to go in a particular direction, like I'll hold him high and support him with that. Um, yeah. That's amazing. I, I, I just want to thank you for, for speaking out on this, because this is such an issue that we, a lot of us don't talk about, like you said, Philip, it, it's, it's painful to go in the past sometimes. And we, we all live like kind of like our, our life as a lie, because we don't want to admit to how we used to be or the mistakes we made. And we go on and people look at us like, Oh, look, they have the perfect life. They don't, they don't have any issues in their, in their marriage and they're raising a family. And it, it took me a similar moment to realize that I'm not helping anyone. I'm not helping myself and I'm not helping anyone out there because everyone has issues. Everyone has a past. We could pretend that it didn't happen. We could, uh, you know, move on with our life and just kind of put the blinders on, but we don't have healing and we don't have anything to look forward to because we're just living kind of like a lie in a sense. And to come to reality and say, you know what, this did happen. 
here's my past. I'm going to work with it. And I'm going to, after that, you, you're teaching others how to deal with it. And I just think that's such a service for everybody out there. Well, I want to know what the reaction from other people are after the book. Everyone, I, I should have started out with this. Like I said, I am the worst so salesperson. Yeah. This is one last talk. It's an amazing book. We're going to get through yes. it. I did some work on it. I mean, I was shared with Philip, who's on our master class this week mm -hmm. that I, you know, he directed me to do the work. And what Phil said is, I said, actually, it was really hard to do the work. And Phil said, it's really harder not to do the work because it always goes back to the work and to this one last talk. Phil, can you discuss why you wrote the book and, and you know, mm -hmm. what that one last talk really represents and what it means? Yeah. I mean, I suppose I was trying to create a forcing function, even though that's an energy I don't like, a sense of urgency. Um, you know, there's a, a little anecdotal story about the man I shared this the other day in the masterclass about the man who goes to the hospital. Uh, his father is dying and the doctor comes out and says, it's time. And he said, my dad's dying. And he said, no, not, not today. It said, it's time to have the conversation. And the son looks at the doctor and says, what conversation? He said, the conversation you probably should have had 25 or 35 years ago. Mm. And something that's very important to me is truth, like facing truth. And trust me, I, I'm a master at hiding from it, mm -hmm. um, you know, dodging it, pretending it didn't happen. And the more I realized having the courage to step in and facing the things that you're not proud of, the things you don't like, the, the pains that you've been through, it, uh, somebody once said, I don't know who, maybe it was the Bible, I don't know, the truth will set you free. And, and I used to kind of probably laugh or chuckle at that because I didn't want it, I didn't want it to be true. But there is no truer saying. And then having the courage to bring that truth into the world and publish it in a book mm. or various mediums, whether it's a speech or whatever, is um, is a different form of, of courage. And you get mixed reactions. Typically, the people closest to you are the ones that will judge you deeply and cut and those and those comments cut deeply. And that's often the reason why we don't speak our truth into the world, whether it's to one person or a million people. Um, so I would say we had a mixed response. I'll finish by saying this. The, with the first time I wrote a book, the very first book I wrote, uh, I wasn't expecting a gold medal or somebody playing a violin or rolling out a red carpet. But when you come from a very uh, you know, severe uh, learning disability and reading and writing is a challenge, you publish your first book. It, it is a moment, if you can find it, to be proud. I received hundreds of comments on Facebook from friends and clients in Canada and Ireland. And I received one comment from Ireland, my home country. And all it said was, now don't get big, too big for your boots. Um, so often it's the people that are closest to us want us to be happy. They just don't want us to change. Mm. Therefore, they don't really support the change in the evolution. Uh, and therefore, we often remain contracted to some extent. Perlin, you, you, you perked up at that <laughs> comment. Can you dive into what Philip said? Because it seems like it really resonated with you about people closest to you not wanting to change. Yeah, I, you know, well, I've experienced this myself, as I said earlier, when Philip started to work on himself, he started to, you know, he was um, really upset, it was too difficult. And so I, I wanted to keep him as he was, like, I didn't want him to change. And then, or I didn't want him to be upset, but then he started to change a bit. And I remember a pivotal moment, and I don't know if you remember this, Phil, but um, he started doing this course and I was like getting pissed off with him. I was like, you know, this is not, he's coming home happy and he's like, <laughs> you know, he's changing. I'm like, what's going on here? And I realized in that moment that I had a choice to make, do I bitch and moan and be annoyed with him and be resentful? Or do I like get on the gravy train and say, Hey, I want some of that. And I want to grow and change. And I stepped into growing and changing, thank goodness, because I don't know if we'd have lasted you know I think um you know we often talk about this about being on you know getting on the same track and you know being on the same page and we don't necessarily agree with that I mean I think we think that you should grow yourself personally and, and move along together rather than being on the exact same page and can you talk about the trust that you have to have between the couple to do that? I mean, you have to trust Phil that he's growing. You have to trust Phil the choices that he's making, bringing you on the show, not knowing what you're going to expect on the show. Um, you know, being part of that that silent rock that Phil, I know he must lean on you for that support and and for helping grow the family. Can you talk about trust between between a, a spouse, a couple? Well, I think. Um... We have immense trust between us, uh, but I think that's something you've got to work on. And that comes with having difficult conversations, being supportive through crises, um, and just being really open and coming back to that word truth again. I think um, the truth will set you free. 
uh, yeah. So I think if you can be truthful and open and honest, and I think that's what it comes down to and having really open and difficult conversations, mm. like not easy. Yeah. There's one thing I want to share in this. It just, literally just came up as, as you guys were speaking. And it's a, it's a story about, uh, I'm not sure if you guys even know this, but we, I've been working with couples for, it must be 17 years now. And finally we decided to run a couples retreat many, many years ago, simply because so many clients had asked for it. And every two years or so we'll do a couples retreat. And it's probably some of the most important work we've done. And I'll tell you very clearly why from my perspective is because the beneficiaries are typically the kids. If there are kids in the family, they get to see mom and dad in a more peaceful state and so on and so forth. And I digress a little bit, but I'll always remember, and this is just such, somebody might be listening to this in the future and they go, great, okay, the trust thing, but how do you build trust? And I often find that we're asking surface questions about things that are very, very deep and meaningful. And there was a couple in the room and I invited Pauline in and Pauline, one of Pauline's, I suppose, journeys in this world and continues to be is how does she step into her own power and how does she step into working with people? And particularly in the light of me doing what I do, because often that casts a shadow where you start to say, well, like, can I compete? And of course, it's not about competing. It's about just showing up as you. Mm -hmm. But this couple were in the room. Pauline joined me for the first time ever in one of these retreats, these couples retreats. And a couple said, what do you do with money? I'll never forget this. What do you do with money? And I said, what do you mean? Making it, saving it? No, in terms of bank accounts, do you have a single bank account? Do you have joint bank accounts? Do you have separate bank accounts? And the intellectual answer that they wanted was us to simply tell them what we did. Oh, let's just, and let's just say hypothetically, it was two separate accounts and then we have this joint account for all the bills and whatever. And then they were gonna maybe model that and go off into the world. But that wouldn't solve anything. And the question I asked was, forget about what we do. Mm -hmm. What do you do? And they said, well, we have separate bank accounts. Then I said, what do you want to do? And he said, I want to have a single bank account. And she said, I want to have a separate account because I want to remain independent as a woman, to which every other woman in the room was kind of doing one of these go girl, you know, kind of almost mm -hmm. like chanting, which I, I get. And I looked at her and I asked a very simple, very important question. I said, as a woman in this world, do you feel independent? And there was a pause. And then the tears started to roll down her face. And she said, no. And I said, so we can talk about money, which is the Band-Aid, or we can talk about independence and what it feels like not to be independent. And we can begin to peel back the onion on that conversation. Where do you want to go? And, I'll, and then I'll finish on this. Her husband, which was fascinating, was sitting in the room and he literally went back in his seat and was looking at his wife at this completely new, profound insight and realize in that moment, it has got nothing to do with money. Uh -huh. And the problem with couples like that is they'll spend the rest, next five years opening 20 accounts and offshore accounts and they're gonna count in Switzerland and it's still never gonna solve her desperate desire and need to be independent and safe in the world. But they're the conversations we're not having as couples historically or typically. Wow. So wow. for, for my it's wife, amazing. it's money's a little different. August 30th, 1998. <laughs> I've shared this with people. My wife became financially free. We were married. So money was off the table for her, her duties and responsibilities, be a stay-at-home mom and to have six kids. We had the clarity. That's what we wanted for our yeah. family. So yeah. you need to have that conversation amongst. Well, I think what you said was huge though, is that she didn't feel independent. I, I think I always did. And I, and I wasn't, that wasn't even a thought in my head mm -hmm. that he would hide money or it wasn't. It, I knew he would take care of us. Got and, it and all, I, baby. I, you, whatever you want, well, <laughs> it's all yours. You know what I'm saying? I'm not a high needy person. So I'm difference. the high needy person. Remember that. Oh, no, we know that. We know that. <laughs> when, when Christmas time comes, I mean, we get the list. We get the whole list. The kids are like, mom, what do you want? I'm like, mm, whatever, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> whatever you find. It's very different. But I think that's such an important conversation that we all need to have with each other and ourselves. And if there is an ongoing issue, just like you said, with the money, why is the money an issue? Is, is another bank account going to, going to solve my problem? If it's a no, I mean, like, that's huge. That's a big deal. And that's why yeah. we have to get, you know, you said something, I think in the book, it was about talking about and examining your past and where you came from and the importance of that and, and where you are now and what your, what your beliefs are now, what your thoughts about life are. And just in, in this situation, what your, even your thoughts on marriage is. And your role in marriage is, is such a big deal. Do the two of you want yeah. to talk about that? Yeah, well, we talk a lot about your relationship to relationships. So what did you, what did you, what did you learn um, growing up um, about relationships around you, your parents or otherwise, grandparents, guardians, your spheres of influence? 
and you will undoubtedly carry those learnings into your married life. So we spend a lot of time talking about that mm. and how things show up. And there's something we do with the couples retreat. We, we often ask people, we don't call it a laundry list, but we ask people to bring what are two or three things that your husband or your wife or your partner, or your girlfriend, your boyfriend does that pisses you off or you want to change. Um, and uh, often those lists are more than two or three things. And you can often see people, they arrive at the event and they're, and they're almost like, oh my God, when do I get my list? Can I share my list? Can I share my list? Can you just get to my list? And I go, listen, you've all brought a list and you can just feel the energy, right? And it could be he leaves the socks on the ground and it could be more fundamental things. And we don't work with couples who are broken. We want to work with couples that want to deepen their relationship and want to be proactive because the science shows that couples wait five years too late to work on their relationship. And what is a hairline crack today becomes the Grand Canyon in a period of time. And that's not to scare people. It's to make people aware that you don't need to be broken to go to therapy. You need to, I believe, go to therapy so you don't break. And when, when this laundry list comes to this event, we don't address it. In day one, we say, right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to break you up um, uh, you know, in the room. And you're going to work on a whole set of questions and exercises around your relationship to relationships, what you witnessed, what, you, what was said and what was unsaid. How did your parents love each other? How did you witness that? What was trust like? What was conversation around money? And when we bring the couples back, we get them to sit in front of each other and just feed back what they witnessed as children. So two things happen. One is they learn about themselves in a way that they probably haven't learned before. But secondly, their partner gets to see how they grew up or grew up in a house that they had no insight into before. And after the second morning or so, we finally go to the laundry list. And to this day, I've said, right, anybody want to talk about the laundry list? The competition, the complaints, the anger, the frustration, the resentment is replaced by nothing other than compassion mm -hmm. and a sense of empathy to whereby, and I'm simplifying it, he doesn't leave his socks on the ground because he's an ass. He leaves them on the ground because that's all he witnessed as a child. And I'm simplifying. There are a lot more Ooh, fundamental yes. uh, patterns that we're talking about here. And they start to see that. And this, this sense of compassion is replaces that sense of competition in the relationship. And that, that is a magnificent thing to, to, to bear witness to. As everyone's That's listening amazing. to this, just go to philipmccrina.com. Yeah. Take a look at, you know, how many different ways you can work with Phil. The first step is to buy the book. The next step is to take a look at his different retreats. My question to Pauline is, you see that the genius and the gift that Phil has, as you're having conversations with him, he can pull out one word and talk about that one word and really dive deep and like, like someone's like sticking a knife into you and twisting and turning. It. And, and he's not doing that. That's just his gift. I mean, we were on the masterclass on Monday and he pulled out that amazing. one word from one of the students said honesty. And he just stopped and he made the person think and he made mm -hmm. the person think, are you a hundred percent honest about yourself? And that student said, stopped and said, no. Well, and that, he said, do you trust yourself? You trust yourself hundred percent. And people said, no, and that's got to be painful, yeah. but great. Your greatest gift lies next to your greatest pain. So if you can understand that, you can tackle the next obstacle. So the question, Pauline, is how is it living with somebody like that? Oh, it can be exhausting, Gino, <laughs> um, on one level, but it's actually amazing to see uh, Philip go take a word or a concept, or I might say something and just go in this tangent and uh, land on something that I hadn't even thought of. And I've been trying to figure out how he's he can do this but I still haven't managed it after 20 years so um it's really amazing and um you know it, it can be if you're frustrated with him or I were trying to have an argument and I'm not very good at arguments but then maybe that's for a, another day or maybe another story it can be for on. today I'm happy to make it today let's make it today I'll tell you the story about arguments in a second but um you know uh, usually he can uncovers the, we were talking about it earlier, like what's under the surface. It's not about the bank accounts. It's about the being independent as a woman. So usually that's where these conversations go. And it's, it, it's actually, it's brilliant in the end, but as the wife of the guy who can do it, it can be a little bit, um, yeah, annoying, annoying sometimes, <laughs> but you know, I know he comes from the right place and his heart's in the right place. So I'm good with that. Just um, take out the garbage, Phil. That's all I want you to do. Stop bothering me. Sometimes yes. you just want to do that. And it can be exhausting. But if you have a higher enlightenment and you understand that his gift is listening to people and mm -hmm. all he's just trying to do is to provide feedback and to make you a better person, 
a better version of yourself, that's a great place. But sometimes your level of energy is just low. You've had a rough day and it's tiring sometimes. But I think- Well, I think too, the beauty of the relationship is- for you, Gino, to know when I'm in that in that mood. And yes, you can say things to irritate me on questioning the one words that I say, or you can be like, you know what, Julia's not, maybe I'll wait for that one. That's also, it's also a gift. I'm not Would you agree with that, Phil? I'm not, I'm not that enlightened, <laughs> Julia. Yeah, I know. I, I, I don't think I quote unquote coach Pauline on a daily basis, but the, the, I suppose the, the one thing as I'm sitting here listening, there's, 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 there's two little parts to this that are really important. Oops. One is that... I used to decide, make a conscious decision not, not to coach at home. Mm -hmm. And I was deeply dishonoring myself because it's not about coaching. Mm -hmm. There is not Philip McKernan in work and Philip McKernan in his private life. There is the same thing. And anyone who gets to know me, any client that comes to Ireland and spends time with us or comes to our home, and we often invite people for dinner to our home, they go, God, you, you, you literally are the same person. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it surprises me that they're surprised, but, but that's, that's number one. The second thing is, and this might freak some people out and I may not even get this across and I don't share this that much because it is a little bit deep and personal, but it's not actually me. I'm not actually as good as people think I am. I'm not this genius. I'm not this incredible vest. I'm just, I believe, and when I realized this myself, the level of burden, of the burden that I carry in the world began to release and relinquish to some extent. I have been put on this world for a reason. And the work that I do comes through me. It does not come from me. My ego wants to own it. Mm -hmm. It wants to own every ounce of it, but it doesn't. And I think when people understand that, they become less frightened of me because I do act as a mirror. And for many, they can't handle that. They just mm -hmm. can't handle it. Pauline, talk about the argument. Let's get back to something a little That's, more light. I, well, I just, that was, that I just was want to say what, right what Philip said is amazing. What you just said, the humility that you have is super impressive. Yeah. Would you agree? So you're saying that I need to show more humility. I was just looking at you, Philip. Can you me. help me? Needy, I would literally just humble. look in his direction. I've got a big ego. I mean, Phil, you're killing me here. Work with me a little bit here. <laughs> Listen, I'm just going off Julia's list that she sent me privately. <laughs> make, make sure you bring this up, Philip. Make I think sure we need a private up. session. <laughs> and I will wire $25 to your bank account. I'm just going through the list, Gino. That's all Underwear is going to be all over the room tomorrow. I'm telling you that right now. I'm going to leave out all the... <laughs> it's uh, funny, though. When you when someone says something, you go off to another question. I'm like, hold on a second. Holy that argument! You, you had a said. great story about the about oh, that argument. Yeah. You, can you recall that story for us? So um, this is actually about our relationship to relationships. So when years ago when we first uh, got married, and Philip and I would have an argument, and I couldn't handle it. I thought we were heading for the divorce courts. This is just awful. I couldn't handle it, and so we drilled deep. Um, we started to drill down and I'm like, why? Like I'd have these, like, I thought it was the end, you know, and I couldn't um, get through them. And so I, one day I was talking to Philip and I said, well, you know, it's interesting. My, I've never heard my parents argue. And in fact, I asked my mom one day, did she ever argue with my dad? And she was like, uh, I think maybe once we've had an argument. And so I thought this was really cool. And I thought, how amazing is that? Like my parents were blissfully happy. And so it turns out that that's probably not entirely true. They didn't air their frustrations. Mm -hmm. We, as their kids, never learned to, how to navigate adversity, you know, conflict. And so rather than um, stepping into arguments, I'd run away and I would, I'd shut down and I wouldn't be able to get through it. And so the beauty of us going through that is now that, well, I'm a much better arguer, thank goodness. Um, but I, I got a much better understanding of where I came from and Philip actually then could understand why I shut down and became defensive and backed off from the argument. That's amazing. You know, I, I the story you told before, or Philip, that what you were saying before about listening to your spouse's childhood and all the aspects, the good, the bad, the, you know, I don't want to talk about it anymore. All of that is so crucial for a healthy marriage because now you get a little insight on why they do what they do. And we mm -hmm. can, as partners, help and encourage them, lift them up when they need help and understand them differently than we had before. And I think, like you said before, that's why a lot of people aren't successful in their marriages and they do end in divorce because of that. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah. I would. And I it also think it's important for kids as well, yes. because now we think about, okay, what are we doing here now? What are the kids learning? Mm -hmm. And how do we want them to show up in their relationships? So I think it's- it Yeah, the kids is, an, is another, I mean, they watch. We have, our children are home. 
we've homeschooled from the beginning. We have two, one's out of college already, one's still in college, but they see the dynamics. They see it all. They see when we argue. They know when I'm upset. They know all I of that. I got my hands flying. So we might be I'm not even arguing, just talking. I'm <laughs> well, very, our, our I'm oldest very was confused because he's very Italian. He uses his hands. We're talking politics in the front seat of the car. And my daughter for weeks and weeks thought we were having this horrible argument. And she was so upset. And finally, she came to me. She's like, Mom, I just can't handle you and dad fighting anymore. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> and it turned out we were just talking. <laughs> but, you know, my husband with the hands all over the place and well, the now they do. frustration. But yes, and that's important. They this is their childhood. They're going to be adults at some point, married at some point, And we're going to be their story. <laughs> So it's yeah. kind of yeah. yeah. scary. Can the both of you touch upon, you know, vulnerability? You talk about vulnerability and it, I think it's a key aspect. Being able to say sorry to your children is something that I've learned the last few years is very difficult letting go of the ego. And even the children, we make mistakes and to say sorry to them is really important. Can you talk about vulnerability? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a huge, huge, huge subject. And um, to me, vulnerability is the gateway to connection. It is, it is the, it is the gateway. It is the only gate. If you think about any relationship in your life, it has only deepened on the back of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. The challenge with vulnerability is it, it has not just, just become a buzzword. It's become a tool that people use. And you'll often go to conferences now and see yes. speakers attempting to connect with a very tender story or intimate story that they haven't actually processed and they haven't actually worked on. And they're, they're, they, they've read in a book that it's the thing to do. And, and, and it can be a lovely connection point to an audience, but it, 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 it's often used as, as a tool. And I think wrongly so. Um, but to me, vulnerability is, is huge. And, I, and if I go back over our relationship, I think the moments and the times when we have deepened our relationship, and I believe will continue to deepen our relationship is when we allow the person to see parts of us that we have hidden, not just from them, but from ourselves and the world. Um, you know, Pauline shared something with me and I'm, you know, I think she's quite open with it. It's in the book um, about being sexually abused. And when I first heard that, I think it's an important, it, it's an important, my reaction was, is important because I made it temporarily all about me. That why didn't you tell me? Why, why didn't you trust me? Why? And what I then did was I held her physically, emotionally, mentally. And then I asked myself a better question. Why did you react that way? What did you do? What did you say? Or what did you not say that created an environment where perhaps she didn't feel comfortable in sharing with you that it's not about you? Mm -hmm. And I think that helped us deepen. I think the mistake we make is if I ask a relationship, if I ask a couple, how close are you in a scale of one to 10? They say nine. Mm -hmm. To me, I think that's with respect complacency because you're making an assumption that there's only 10% growth. If someone said to me, how good a dad are you today? I would say five. They go, oh my God, like uh, you're the most amazing. I got to you. You're, uh, you know, I know I would say five because yeah. I have to be, I cannot be anything more than a five because mm -hmm. then there's no, not a whole lot more growth for me. Mm -hmm. And I would respectfully say the same as a husband. That's a great Jewel, point. what's my number, Jewel? We'll, Come talk, on, baby. we'll talk about it after. When double we're, digits. When I got to hit the double digits. in our personal uh, <laughs> <laughs> therapy <laughs> sessions. <laughs> 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 I think I think this is a very important question. I mean, it's really about the book, Bill, uh, Phil. How do you Phil, How do you find the, your one last talk? How do you find we'll talk it? about? Well, let's talk about what that is. I, I want yes, you to yeah. Let's talk about what that you mean by that one last talk. So to me, I feel that one last talk is a therapeutic, cathartic experience. It can introduce you to the essence of who you are. And I think if I so for for example, if I said to you. Um, I want you to create a, a talk and over the next 10 years, I want you to find it and, you know, hone it in and, and, and for it to be the greatest representation of who you are and allow the world to know who you are through this talk. And um, you might eventually get there, but I think if you're given this invitation and challenge to go and create your one last talk, I think what it does, is it just creates that sense of urgency. And it's an opportunity to share a part of your personal truth, a part of your personal narrative. It is not, and I repeat, not an opportunity at all to lecture the world on what it should and should not do, to have an opinion that could be politically charged or economically charged around Donald Trump or around economics or around global warming or COVID or any of that stuff. It's about sharing a part of yourself that perhaps you don't want the world to know potentially, perhaps that you don't see value in. And the whole idea, the whole vision for this is Peggy, who's this fictional character who lives in Yellowknife in Northern Canada. 
And I just envisioned this person who maybe is not very super wealthy, has access to the internet, doesn't travel a lot. And she's had something happen to her or she's done something in the world. And this shame, which a lot of us are crippled by, this regret eats away at her, but she doesn't even realize it. And she goes online one day and she, or on a podcast or whatever, and she hears Pauline share her one last talk or Julia share her one last talk or a man. It doesn't have to be a woman and share something that she herself has been intimately introduced to at some part, part of her life. And in that moment, two things happen. She, um, she realized in that moment that she is not on her own. And she realizes in conjunction with that, that she's not broken. And the final piece is if she can realize that and put a value on her own skin, maybe she might muster the courage to share that truth with at least one other human being before she dies. Because if you don't share it with somebody, it festers inside of us and, it, and it's cancerous. I would say literally mm-hmm. cancerous. Mm-hmm. And that is the vision. So to me, it's about eradicating loneliness or a sense of isolation of people. This is not a book that I think would sell. Trust me, would have come up with a sexier title that's a lot more approachable. This is not a, not easy work, as you know said, but it is very freeing work. And at the same time, Pauline, how has that amazing. helped you, you know, when you created your one last talk? What did it do for your life? Um, it made me uh, feel much lighter and more open. And um, I think I held myself back a lot and hid a lot uh, in my life. And I think sharing my truth has allowed me to move forward and not you know just I think live freer and do more and you know I often think some people live you know in a bandwidth you know when I think if you can go deep and uncover your one last talk you can you know go to greater heights in your yeah. life and that might sound a bit cliched but I really believe that and don't we all want that I mean if you really think about it of course we would want to be freer and lighter and feeling like wow I, I'm, I got that off my chest finally after 20 years or whatever it is we all want it, but we're so afraid. Well, what if, right? What if, what yeah. are the other people going to think? What if yeah, they what judge the me? Judgment? Yeah. So talk yeah. about judgment. Let's Pauline. talk That's about something that. really important. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, you, it was very interesting when I shared the piece in the book and I don't know if you've uh, come to that part yet. Um, but uh, I got a lot of love and support um, a little bit like what Philip talked about earlier, like people in the U S and Canada and our clients and friends there were very supportive not so much from um, Ireland, um, from close family, which was very hurtful, I would think. However, there's not a lot I can do about that. I n- know that I did the right thing. And, you know, I trust that, yeah, I, I, I trust it was the right thing. But judgment, I felt very judged, extremely mm-hmm. uh, judged, but better. So, you know, I can handle the judgment because... You know, I think I have this saying that it's better to be judged for who you are than who you are not. Mm. Um, so I would rather speak my truth. And if people don't like it, then and I don't think it's that they don't like it. I think that it's hard for them to see someone they love hurt and maybe they don't want to face that. So that's their journey and their story. Pauline, let me ask you another question. How do you get people to give their one last talk? How do you motivate people or inspire people other than working with you guys and reading the book? Someone's yeah. sitting there. I don't. I don't have anything worthy to say. No one's going to listen to me. I'm wasting my time. And it always comes back, as Philip said, to the work. It comes back to that. You have to do it. I think it's facing the truth is difficult for us. We have to say, you know, this really did happen. This is real. And once we write it down, now it just became real. But how do, how do you, I mean, when you're working with people or you're talking to people, how do you 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 actually Mm -hmm. let them know that this is a vital component of their lives? Well, I think um, the fir- the reaction initially is like, yeah, I don't have anything to share. My mm-hmm. story is not worth listening to and or hearing who would want to listen to it and all those self, the doubt. I, I think, though, I mean, Philip, you talk to the clients usually and ask them to do their talk, but they seem to trust us when we ask them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's also, I think, a bit of intrigue as well as to how, what, um, will come up and I think it's a self-worth thing as well I think people kind of you know if they're asked to do, to do it I think they step in and, and you know have a bit of I, um, you just mentioned something belief. that they you said that they trust you and I think that's really important because I wonder if a lot of our people in our past whether that's family we don't trust them to tell them our truth and I think that might be an issue that we have to think about is who are we trusting in our life who are we not trusting 
you know, I, let's say I go on your retreat and I've just met you. How am I telling you my, my deep, my deepest, darkest, darkest secrets in my past, but I can't even tell my husband or I can't even tell my sister. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something to talk about. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 an interesting one. Um, I would I would say to people when we think about trust, somebody will say to me, "Do you trust X?" Mm -hmm. And I go, "Well, there's different types of trust. Do I trust them with my wallet or my children? But do I trust that they trust themselves to make the right call or the right judgment call?" Um, and often, I I to me, trust starts at home. It's like, and I mean, not home as in your physical, but inside yourself. And most human beings, going back to the masterclass uh, comment from earlier on, most human beings don't. And it's not about fully trusting yourself because that's a degree of perfection that we're looking for, but trust themselves more and more and more. I, I, most people don't believe they've got a one last talk or a one last talk worth listening to. And I would say, I'm not going to try to find a compassionate world. I would just say bullshit. I would say absolutely 100% bullshit. And we've proved people so wrong in so many ways. You know, I, I may or may not have said this to Gino, but we brought it into a maximum security prison. Um, we were told we wouldn't be allowed to do it. Um, the inmates wouldn't deliver their talks. Um, I said, not just are we going to do it, uh, we're going to get it recorded. And we brought it in and we got we had six men yes. uh, deliver their one last talk. Now, this may be a polarizing comment. Um, some of these, if not the majority of men, had taken somebody else's life, if not multiple lives. And I'm not here to justify and rationalize their behavior because you can't. But what I can say is, what I learned that day was, it was probably the most profound day of my life in the context of any type of learning. I thought I'd heard it all or lots. Um, I was, I could barely drive home after that event. And we have not done anything with those recordings because I don't know what to do with them. Um, because I don't believe we're, we have the right to commercialize those and, and, and utilize them in, in, in ways other than releasing them in a very and we will release them but we have to release them because they're so remarkably powerful and the healing we saw that day with with them a prison officer took the mic and they're they just don't comment and he says i've never taken a mic i've never come he says i just want to thank these men we had a woman in the room who we brought in 50 people as an audience and with 50 other inmates and we had a woman who had gone through serious sexual assaults and abuse and she went up to a sex offender who just given his one last talk put her arms around him, which she was not meant to do, and said to her husband with tears rolling in her face, I don't want him to go back into the prison. I want to protect him. Wow. It was the most profound. I don't think there's many things as healing, potentially, as a one last talk. And I'm not saying that to sell the book. I, I genuinely am not. I just think it's a very cathartic process. And I think you can learn a lot about yourself. But the only thing I would say to people is trust yourself and go deeper than you even think you can. And all we're trying to uncover is the stuff that's already there. We're not trying to make stuff up. We're not trying mm -hmm. to upset you. We're not trying to, all we're doing is shining a light on what already exists inside of you. That's it. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, I just encouraging everyone to get the book, to get the one last talk, because I, I mean, I I've done a smaller version of this for the past few years, and I cannot believe what um, a freedom I had from that by just revealing truth, writing it down and discovering that it, you know, other people go through it. And because of my story and my difficulties in life, we can help so many people. And the mm -hmm. two of you have done that, you know, you've brought freedom and, and, and to so many people out there. And I know from this podcast, pretty much everyone is going to get the book and to do the work because it's worth it. Pauline, where can the listeners get a hold of you and Philip and learn more about how to work with you guys? Um, we have onelasttalk.com or philipmckernan.com is our main website. So that's P-H-I-L-I-P -I -I McKernan, M-C-K-E-R-N-A-N.com. What is on the horizon for you guys the next three to five years? What are you planning on doing? What are your big aspirations or goals? Do you have anything? Well, I don't know if you shared about the castle. We bought a castle in Ireland, <laughs> which we are working on and bringing back to life. And that's so it's about 500 to 800 years old. We're not quite sure if we're bringing that back to life. So that's really exciting, keeping us really busy. Uh, we have a few events here in Ireland, uh, personal growth events that we're going to, we have people coming from all over the world to attend. And Philip, what else? Immediately was, 
what do I see for my wife in the next five years? <laughs> and oh I'm gosh. happy if you'd answer this for me. And this is not designed to okay. put her under pressure or anything else. Oh, I'm so excited. I, I see Pauline <laughs> stepping into healing and mm-hmm. and leadership and, and holding space for others in a call it coaching, whatever the term is. And I believe, and I say this with love and respect, she's been hiding from that gift for a long time Mm -hmm. and using me perhaps as an excuse. Um, So I see her stepping into that in in a major, and I say major way, it's not about thousands of people or millions of books. Mm -hmm. It's not about that. It might become that, but holding space for other women and potentially other men. And I feel that that's her gift. And and for what it's worth, I would love, I was, if I was to die tomorrow, and I was looking down or looking up or where I was looking for, I'd love to see her do that in the world because I think the world has been deprived of that right now. That is awesome. Very similar to my wife's yeah. story. Uh, she was always, you know, behind the shadows. and always I was petrified out. of people. Let's just yeah. say that. And now she's, you know, to have the gift. And Phil, I'll share the story with you really quick, if you don't mind. Um, yep, it was 2018. First. We were driving to an event, a little meetup, 50, 60 person meetup. And I do a presentation. I th- th- think I did okay. I mean, it was nothing, nothing major. And I get off, I'm saying, you know, hi to everybody. And a couple of people come up to my wife and a couple tears in their eyes going, you know, to my wife, but he changed my life. I mean, he's amazing. What a gift to be married to him. And she's like, what the hell are you people talking about? Who is this? Who is this jabroni? What? And I think that finally My question got was, her. what does he do? <laughs> so see that, Phil? I'm the needy one. She has no idea what I'm doing in life. I'm changing lives. And, yeah. and, and to that, I think that's how we should deal with spouses. I mean, let them know, let them in. I, I wanted her in on my life. And I guess she never connected. She heard the word life coach and made a connotation of what she thought that meant. Whereas mm. I think coaching is great. It's just not coaching it's business. It's actually giving the person the space to be able to talk and, and being inspiring. We're not without being the hero. I'm just the guide. We're the guide in this podcast and you guys are the hero. And that's what my goal is to sh- shine a light on showing how I may have 1500 units or I may have the success, but it's not about me. How do I achieve that? And how can we help others do that? And from that day on, she became, you know, well, I saw, like he said, I saw what, what happened with, through him, like mm-hmm. you were saying, Philip, it's not, it's not, it's not you. It's not me. It's, it's mm-hmm. what's happening on the other side and how many people's mm-hmm. lives are just changed for the better. Yeah. And, uh, you know, yes, I'm terrified of people. I'm afraid to talk to people. I, I never in my life would I get on a stage and talk to people. Oh my gosh, that would, probably was my worst nightmare. But yeah. because of what it came from it, I said, yes, because my husband yeah. had faith in me. I'm like, all right. <laughs> and now she's gone on stage with hundreds of people and I sing opera while she's there. I like to embarrass her, like to, you know, like to stick it in a little bit, like use those one words. I have my yeah. little tricks, but, and I enjoy it. So but Pauline, it's, it's awesome. this is for you. Go yeah. and do it because you're amazing and you have a story to tell you. and you are going to help countless people. You don't, you're not even going to know, but God knows. And that's all that matters in the end. Well, thank you. Do you guys mind if I recap this really quick 20 second recap of the, of the show? No, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So I wrote notes down the one last talk and I could not come up with these big, these words are too big for me. It's a therapeutic cathartic experience that connects us to the essence that eradicates loneliness. Rewind that everybody stick that in your pipe. That's an awesome way to describe the book. And I think the last thing is everyone out there, what is the most important conversation that you're not having? That's such a, uh, an empowering question for everybody out there. Let that sit because that's what you have to do once you shut off the recording. If nothing else, if you don't buy the book, stop drinking Starbucks for the next three or four days. It's 15, 20 bucks. There's so much value in this. What is that most important conversation that you're not having? Do that. Start working towards that. And I think you've, you'll derive a tremendous amount of value from this show and from continuing to follow Philip. Yeah, this, this was an incredible podcast. I just want to thank the both of you. Uh, you're two incredible people. And I just want to continue this relationship with you. But what can you give us any last thoughts, any last thoughts to the listeners that you want to get out? I've got one. Yeah. And uh, again, wasn't planned, but um, we've got to stop making this journey about us. Mm-hmm. And um, there's, there's, when I work with people, I started working with um, coaches who want to, who want to hold space for others and don't fully trust their gift. It's not about teaching them a system. It's about holding space and bringing their gift out into the world. And I, I never imagined I do that work, but I love it. And the number one thing I harp on about it, it's not about you. It's not about you. And when we get out of ourselves and contemplate 
the pain in the world and the disconnectedness and how the world needs to be helped, we will do extraordinary things because we have to. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would encourage people to stop making their journey about themselves. It's not about you. And um, you're depriving the world potentially of, of the gifts that you have if you don't begin to think like that to some extent. Oh, that's awesome. Pauline, we have to hear from you last because you're the Absolutely. silent rock that holds everything up. I know that. <laughs> I, it's evident from meeting Philip. So any last words? Okay. Well, I think um, as this is about relationships, I'll bring it back to relationships. Yes. And I think the number one thing uh, that I bring to Philip um, is belief. I 100% believe in him and always um, have done and hopefully always will. So I encourage you um, in your relationships to find um, whatever, like find your part, to just believe in them and hold them high. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love that. And from Philip McKernan, I am the one who does most of the talking and I am very humbled when people listen. So a lot of people have been listening to you. So it, it's been a really great show. Once again, thanks a lot for the both of you for spending the time with us and good luck on any future endeavors. Thanks yeah, guys. Thank it's been an honor. Thank thanks. you guys. Great. See you guys. Thanks everyone.